So now we're going to continue our look on another class of plant hormones called the gibberellins. And we'll entitle this next flowchart just that, the gibberellins. I want to make sure I spell this right. These are more commonly just abbreviated as GAs. And that's what we'll do from this point forward. So as far as a little bit of background in terms of how these were discovered and how they sort of came about in terms of plant hormonal study. In the 1900s, way back in the 1900s, what you had were rice seedlings. And these rice seedlings were a little weird. These rice seedlings, which typically should grow okay, were actually very tall and spindly. So they had this very abnormal structure. And they would always, often, some of these rice seedlings at least, uh, topple over. So they toppled over and they would be no longer viable. They wouldn't live. And this was confusing to farmers and whoever was dealing with these rice seedlings. Later on in the 1930s, and this was a big mystery at this time, 1930s, we move forward a little bit, what we notice and figure out is that there is a specific fungus. And that specific fungus causes this hyper-elongation that we saw above in the 1900s. So hyper-elongation that causes, you know, this tall and spindly toppling over structure. But this is through the secretion via secreting. Remember, fungi are really good at absorbing and secreting things. They actually secrete something called gibberellin. They have their own version of gibberellin. And then later on, what's noticed is that in the 1950s, what's discovered is that plants themselves also produce gibberellins. And when we talk about plants producing gibberellins, uh, we'll write this down as plants produce their own. And uh, we're going to just call them GAs from this point. It's easier for me to write, easier for me to say also. So that's our basic history behind them. Fascinating, I know. And so now what's uh, of interest to us is figuring out what gibberellins do, what GAs do. And that's what we'll do in the next uh, set of parts to this flowchart. Effects of GAs. Okay, so they have three major effects that we're going to be looking at. First and foremost, gibberellins, GAs, promote stem elongation. So we'll write that down. Promote stem elongation. Now, again, what do we notice about plant hormones? A lot of them are involved in growth, and that is the truth. GAs are also going to be involved in stem elongation growth. Now, this would mean that whenever you think of what's being grown, you have to figure out where would that hormone then be produced. This would be then mainly produced, the GAs themselves are mainly produced in growing regions of the plant, specifically those related to the stem, which would be young roots and leaves, mainly produced uh, at young roots, I'll write at over here, and also leaves. Because leaves come off of the stem and they have to grow from the stem. They're basically an elongation from the stem. So we have this sort of location for our GAs where they're produced. So now what do they do? They stimulate, they promote cell elongation. Now this should look familiar to you because we've seen cell elongation before. We looked at the entire mechanism and they also stimulate division of cells. And we've seen this before as well in terms of hormones. We saw cell elongation in the auxin side of the story and division on the cytokinin side of the story. Now, what I want to make clear is that this cell elongation, the mechanism itself is not the same as uh, the auxin. So the mechanism is not equal to auxin mechanism. It's a little bit different in the sense that here, um, just to summarize this mechanism, what we have is, let's say we produce a GA. GA is produced. When GA is produced, this is going to activate uh, certain enzymes. And this activation of enzymes is what's going to directly cause a loosening of the cell wall. And once we loosen the cell wall, that's when we have the expansins. Those uh, proteins will enter and do their job of separating those cross links from the microfibrils. Now, this is a little bit different in terms of the orientation of what comes first, what comes second and third in relation to the auxin mechanism, if you know. Thus, it's different than the auxin mechanism. But what you have to understand, a big theme of today's lecture, is that this acts with auxin. Not against, but with. Just like many hormones do with each other, GAs and auxins act in great concert with each other, in great unity, so thus they are both involved in cell elongation. 
Now, a good example of understanding the cell elongation scene can be uh, looked at in corn. When you think of corn, there's actually going to be a situation where you have a dwarf corn. Okay, dwarf, cor uh, dwarf uh, corn would just be a corn that's abnormally small. And what's noticed experimentally is that if you apply isolated amounts of GA, of gibberlin hormone, onto this dwarf corn, this dwarf corn eventually grows as tall as normal. Grows as tall as a normal corn would grow. And thus, we know that it's definitely involved in some sort of growth pattern, and that's exhibited by this experimental design of dwarf corn plus uh, gibberlin. Now, what's interesting also is that if you take a normal corn, normal corn, you apply the GA on it, this isolated hormone, you apply this, what you actually notice is that there's no response. So what's critical about this is that this hormone is specifically going to be produced during a time of youth, okay? When something is problematic, let's say, like a dwarf corn, then you can use a GA externally and apply it and allow it to grow back to normal. But once a normal growth has already happened, GAs basically sort of pan out. They sort of go away, and thus we see no response in a normal, already grown corn that was manipulated. Now, last thing about stem elongation, a good sort of term to know about this is bolting. GAs are, the dire are directly going to result in bolting, which would simply be the rapid uh, elongation. Again, elongation is the term here. Elongation of a floral stalk. So when a flower wants to grow upwards, right, and it has that stalk region, in order for that to grow correctly upwards, it has to bolt, and bolting is directly sort of related and done. That This is a physiological response governed by the release and production of GAs. So that's our first effect, promoting stem elongation. A big theme here is that auxin is also involved in this, and they act together. And in addition to this, uh, they also, the GAs, are involved in a separate process known as fruit growth. So they are also involved in fruit growth, much like auxin. So again, this acts with auxin. So very important to understand that auxin is, uh, I know it's the primary hormone, it's the most important hormone, but it also has helpers. And GA is a helper, especially for the fruit growth. If you notice in the auxin 2 flowchart, we talked about fruit development, and thus we see fruit development here again. So best way to understand fruit growth via GAs is to look at the direct commercial example. So commercially speaking, um, when you have Thompson seedless grapes, these are very sort of popular grapes that many people buy at a grocery store, supermarket. What happens is you actually spray, a lot of times commercially, what happens is you spray Thompson seedless grapes with GA, okay, with Giberlin, uh, with GA. And once you do that, this actually causes the individual grapes, so the you know, we eat grapes usually one by one. They grow larger and plumper. And this is something that people want. They want large, plump grapes. And thus, when you see these Thompson seedless grapes, they're seedless, which is great. And then you also have these nice, large, plump grapes. This is going to be a great selling point. And that's what's utilized commercially. This GA is commercially utilized to really help sell these grapes in supermarkets and grocery stores. And in addition, not only do the grapes grow larger, but the internodes, because if you know a grape is not necessarily right next to another grape, there's always an internode between them. The internodes themselves elongate. What does this do? This allows for more space. And if you have more space between each individual grape, what do you get? You get individual grapes growing larger. So that's a nice commercial application of GAs in terms of root growth. And finally, last one that we'll do is the idea of seed germination. So GAs are also involved in seed germination, specifically the process of sprouting, which I'll write over here if I can squeeze this in. There we go. Sprouting. So basic mechanism, I'm going to write it out here, would be, uh, first of all, it's premised on the example of barley seeds. And that's going to be seen in figure 39.10. So if you look at a barley seed in figure 39.10, you're going to see the effect of GAs on seed germination. Also, fruit growth, forgot to mention this, is seen in figure 39.9. This idea of the Thompson seedless grapes. A nice picture of these seedless grapes uh, with the GA effect. So back to this. 39.10, you get a barley seed that says barley, not barky, barley seed. So 
first step is the following. It's called imbibition, not inhibition, but it's actually called imbibition. Imbibition is simply going to be when a seed absorbs water and becomes activated. So seed absorbs H2O and plus becomes activated. So seed can either be in a dormant state or an activated state. When it's in an activated state, you are going to be absorbing water as a seed and thus you will undergo imbibition. So once imbibition happens and the seed is activated, the embryo begins to release GA. Embryo releases GA. A bunch of gibberlin hormones. Now this is going to cause a signal. This is a message that's going to signal something. It's going to cause a hormonal response and a physiological response downstream. This will signal a specific part of the seed called the algerone, which is just a thin outer layer of the endosperm. So it signals the outer layer of the endosperm called the algerone. And once that signal has happened, the alurone says, okay, I just noticed that we got a signal from the GA message, that's our messenger, and now I'm going to, as an alurone, synthesize and also secrete digestive enzymes. Secrete digestive enzyme, and the specific one will be uh, alpha amylase. So if you guys remember all the way back from bio 1, amylose or amylase would be the enzyme that's going to break down amylose. Amylose is essentially starch. Starch is a stored product uh, of plants. And so in order for starch to be broken down and utilized, you have to use an enzyme. And an enzyme would be the alpha amylase that only was made because alurone noticed that there was GAs, and GAs came from the fact that the seed was activated. So notice this stepwise orientation that we have here. So once this alpha amylase is made, it travels to the starchy endo inner endosperm. So because it wants to break down starch, it goes to the place where starch is stored, to starchy inner endosperm. And this is still in the seed. Now, why is, the, why is this alpha amylase going here? Well, it's going to break down starch. And when you break down starch, you will mobilize a very important molecule that we all know and love called glucose. You make glucose free from its stored form and turn it into sort of a free molecule that can be used for seed growth. And let's go all the way back to the top. What are we trying to do? We're trying to sprout the seed. We're trying to grow the seed. Have we done that? Yes, because now we have energy in the form of glucose for the seed to very nicely use to undergo seed germination successfully. And this is seen in figure 39.10 very nicely. I suggest seeing that. And that covers our GAs.